So welcome to the Dallas After Effects user group. Glad everybody's here. If you're watching online, you can go to um, Dallas After Effects user group on Facebook at um, facebook.com slash groups slash uh, Dallas AEUG. And uh, actually, if I go over here, you can see that. <clears throat> and tonight, we're going to talk about some kind of workflow things and uh, ways to be efficient in After Effects because if you're efficient in After Effects, that gives you more time to create, right? And uh, one of my joys in life is to figure out how to automate something or have um, you know, the right hotkeys in my arsenal to be able to fly through the interface and do, uh, do a number of things that get me to creating faster. So the first thing here that we're going to talk about is render templates. Uh, do you guys show of hands, set up your own render templates, output modules? Yeah, okay. So you know what I'm talking about here. If I take this composition and add it to the render queue, you can see that we have uh, our render settings and our output module. And my output 2 is not yet specified. I'm not sure if we need to worry about that right now. Um, but I will go ahead and set this up for 2018 February and the renders folder like that. Just so in case we render something, that's where we'll go. And so with our render settings and our output module, we have a lot of things here uh, to look at. But we will open up uh, two, two places we can do this. We can drop down here and make a template. We can also go under Edit Templates and Render Settings. Load this up. And just top to bottom here, we have a movie default and a frame default. A pre-render, movie proxy, still proxy, and I'm, I'm still debating if we're going to talk about proxies tonight because I am not crazy versed in proxies and I don't want to set anybody on the wrong path. <clears throat> so uh, what this means is when you send a movie to the render queue, these are the settings that it's going to have. You can pick from an assortment here. You probably, if you're just looking at your machine, you probably won't have all of these settings. Uh, what's your frame default setting, um, your pre-render, and draft settings up here under my proxy. So what we can do is come down here and look at what these mean. Uh, and there's a, an example here for the best settings. The quality is set to best. The resolution is full. Uh, no proxies. There's a bunch of current settings. Um, so we can even... We want to edit this, look in here and see what it says. Um, for my quality, <clears throat> I can choose between best draft and wireframe, resolution, just like you would see down in your, uh, your viewer. Also, disk cache and frame lending, field render. So if you're doing your best settings, you want to have any anything you have set up in your comp when you hit render for that you want it to be like this is this is what I'm gonna see uh, for the highest the full res all of the effects and all the motion blur and all that um, we don't hopefully have to worry about field rendering anymore <laughs> uh, <Interlace. remember. laughs> so when my kid was little I would say okay Luke Here's, here's your chance to shine. Smoking is, and he would say, bad. And then I would say, 
interlacing is, and he would say, bad. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what I was talking about. But hey, how you doing? Come on in, Jeremy. And so, I'll be here for the next meeting of day. <laughs> uh, so, if, you know, if you're going to have um, a quick render, like a, a draft render here, you're setting up your, your draft, and you want to get through the render really quick, maybe you don't want to have motion blur on. So this is a, a way to globally just turn off motion blur and not have to worry about that. But if you are going to do your full render and you want motion blur, then you want to have either on for checked layers or current settings. And uh, so as we go through this, the kind of uh, got you that happens sometimes is if you have things set to current settings, when you go to render your current settings, it could be, uh, let's go look out here. It could be 50% and half res or third res, and you've got you know your motion blur on and a bunch of stuff, but you don't have any of it checked here and your frame blending and all that. If you do um, current settings, this is what your render is going to look like. So you need to make sure that when you check your render queue up here, if your final render is what you're looking for with full res and all the settings turned on, that uh, you just want to make sure that you're set to that up here and not to the, yes? Same sort of thing, like if you're going to save a frame out, I think it's as like, you know, uh, as a Photoshop document or something. Yeah. You have to make sure that's at full res, otherwise it'll do it at a lower. Yeah, and it'll you'll chrome it out and get it in Photoshop or put it in Premiere, Final Cut, and it won't be the resolution that you thought it was. And you have to go back to After Effects, <laughs> set it up, render it out. So anyway, uh, that's a very good point. And we're going to go back to Edit, Templates, Render uh, Settings. I don't usually spend a lot of time in render settings, uh, except to maybe worry about what my defaults are. Um, but then let's go look at draft settings, what they have for draft settings. So the quality is draft, resolution is half, and frame blending is off, motion blur is off. Um, proxies, all these are, are set to current settings. But like solo switches, very good to you know worry about this kind of stuff. Um, color depth. So you know it's it's important to at, at the very least know this window, understand how to to work in it, and then um, for let's see multi machine settings. We're going to jump in here, and we can see that this option down here under options. Should maybe just say option. I don't know. Uh, is skip existing files. So one of my efficiencies that I'll tell you about in a little bit is rendering <clears throat> from multiple machines or rendering in the background with multiple render sorry render instances. Okay, and if you do that, then you can populate a folder full of images really quickly. Uh, and when each individual instance of After Effects is rendering, it will look at that folder and say, okay, I'm, my plan is now to render frame one. Does frame one exist? If it does, skip until I find a frame that's not rendering and then start rendering that frame. Okay? If you don't have this on, it'll overwrite your file or try to anyway. So that is my multi-machine setting. So that's when rendering to an image sequence. Yes, image sequence, correct. So output modules, this one is a little more... Trent. Yes. Password presidential is not working. I am very sorry. It's supposed to work tonight. If it doesn't, then I'm not sure how to do it. Um, so when I send a movie to render, My setting is going to be, and I've called this ProRes 422. Um, 
that's my <coughs> typical um, mastering codec. So I'm going QuickTime, my format, I look in my video codec, and I set that to 422. That's where you find all of your codecs right here. Question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, how does, I usually just go, like what, if I, let's say if I have to edit and Premiere or whatever, mm -hmm. I usually just go with like animation and <clears throat> go it out as an MOV. I mean, what's, why do you prefer? Okay, so let's talk about codecs. Okay. Uh, the animation codec is going to be a pretty <clears throat> robust codec. It is all, all no codecs. Compression. Right, all, co all codecs have a little bit of compression because you have to have, that's kind of the nature of the thing is that there's some kind of compression yeah. that happens. But animation has Zero. almost as little as you can possibly have. Yeah. What that does is creates gigantic files that are hard for your computer to play back. Um, what you would prefer, what I prefer, maybe what hopefully you would prefer, is a codec that has good, really good quality, but not so much overhead. So uh, ProRes 422 is a good one for that. You're going to have the uh, uh, reasonable quality. On a Mac. Yes, on a Mac. ProRes 422. Yeah. Um, and so uh, let's see. Animation, your color depth can be really, really good. You can also have an alpha channel. Apple Intermediate Codec, your color depth is very uh, low. You're going to have a lot of banding and gradients, stuff like that. Um, the ProRes family is pretty good. I don't use these others. HQ, LT, and Proxy. Does anyone have any experience with those? Yeah. Um, you do? Oh. I know. I know. I know. Yes. Uh, I use H we always use HQ before we when I send any sort of render over to the edit suites. <clears throat> okay. You know, we always use or 422 or uh, the 444, which has the, the uh, transparency. Yeah. Yes. So those, these fours all are referring to um, how much information is in each of those channels. Uh, so can anyone, <clears throat> any, any codec specialists in here speak to these? Uh, 444 has transparency options. Yeah, that fourth or alpha. Yeah, that yeah, fourth, the fourth thing down here is is for the alpha channel, um, and it used to be RGB, but now it's like YUV or something like that. But does so, it have something to do with like how many frames ahead it looks? No, for this it does not. Okay. <clears throat> this is just color and clarity and quality color depth. information. Yeah. <laughs> the, the bit depth for each channel. Yeah, I think you're right. Trying to use YUV. So the four 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 is four bits for Y U B and alpha. And alpha. Mm -hmm. Whereas ProRes regular ProRes is four bits and then two bits two bits. So usually you can't see that a whole lot unless you put it up on a scope. But ProRes four 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 is nearly uncompressed. What is what is Y U V and R G B? Yeah. So Y U V is the it's like chroma and. Um, Gamma and Man, that stuff? maybe maybe it's some of that stuff. We it's, <clears throat> instead of using red, green, blue to come up with all the colors, it comes up with brightness, and then the other two channels are a mix of the other colors. And in I, order to give you the quality, yeah. Instead that, of going that you yeah, want, instead of RGB, like you get out of a out of a prism, they, it's just a different way of mixing up colors and then encoding the colors. Yes, yes. very good. Thank you. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I have a question on H two six four. Yeah, like it always be saturated. Always be saturated after like, like you know, I ProRes or uncompress, <clears throat> and I convert it in Premiere or Encoder or After Effects. It's always desaturated. Anyone know why? how? Like how desaturated? Have you seen different levels of desaturation? I, well, or? I mean, whatever it's ten percent. I don't know what the number is, but it's always noticeable where everything is definitely the colors are, are muted and. Yeah, I. Same. Uh, I don't know exactly the math on it all, but you are definitely throwing away information okay. uh, when you're compressing the H.264. That leads me to another topic here in this codec talk. Is you have the ability to render out to H.264, but H.264 is not 
a, in my humble opinion, I don't know if this is really humble or not, but it's not a render codec. Uh, if you're in a crazy pinch and you need to render something out to H.264 from After Effects, okay, sure, that's fine. But uh, my preference is to render with an uh, interframe, is it intraframe codec? Intraframe. Yeah. So uh, what I'm talking about is, you know, when you're creating a DVD or when you're going to, um, you know, YouTube or Vimeo and you're compressing, you're taking instead of all iframes like this, which is you can pull it up, you have a frame, you go to the next frame, and that's your uh, that's your good solid frame. It has all the information in it. With H.264 and with um, ABCHD, ABCHD and anything maybe you would use to create a DVD, then you're going to have uh, the I frame, and then you're going to have a bunch of B frames. So it would be like one, two, three, four, four, five, six, and then another I frame, or maybe it's like that, and then your B frames again, and then an I frame. And what you're doing is you're throwing away all the information that changes that doesn't change sorry you're throwing all the in information away that doesn't change between these two iframes and you're only keeping what does change and the amount of uh, compression you use the bit rate you use is the determining factor for how much of that information is kept and when you're rendering out of After Effects After Effects renders a frame and writes it to disk then it renders a frame and it writes it to disk. Then it renders a frame and it writes it to disk. Uh, when you're using a compression software like Media Encoder or Compressor or um, MPEG Stream Clip or FFmpeg in the terminal, things like that, then it can look ahead at your movie and figure out what's going to change, get rid of the information, and give you the necessary B frames between your I frames. Okay, so in After Effects, it doesn't do that. It just renders out frames. I don't think that there is anything built into After Effects that can give you the 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 B frame compressing. So when you render out of After Effects, you're going to have gigantic H.264 movies compared to most H.264 movies. What the preference is, is to render out with a codec like ProRes 422 or AVI or whatever your flavor is. And that codec is then high quality master on your disk and you run that through something like Media Encoder or Compressor or something like that and let it do its math to get rid of the information you don't need to make your files smaller. Does that make sense? It's almost like you render out uncompressed that you can and then compress it with the compression tool yes. after it's rendered. Correct. Have you guys found that a media encoder is better than Premiere or are they the same? Um, I don't have an opinion on that. Uh, I started researching FFmpeg inside the terminal I don't know, six or eight years ago. And when I figured out all the wonderful things that FFmpeg and Apple scripting and droplets and all that can do, I just went ahead with going down the road of FFmpeg. Mm -hmm. um, com sometimes I get better results from FFmpeg than I would from, say, Apple's compressor, uh, which was my compression software of choice for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, there's also like episode and things like that. So Visual Hub was an old one. Yeah. Yeah. Squeeze. Yeah. <clears throat> Squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying that before you put it into Adobe Media Encoder, you rendered out ProRes or whatever? You don't, because now you can, you know, it gives you the option to have even After Effects to, to queue it up, and like an After Effects 
project file our composition we know yeah so you, that rather that's actually another efficiency thing you can do is get some comps going and then offload them to media encoder so you can keep working in after effects <clears throat> okay but if you're going to offload the media encoder your project to render then i would still recommend rendering out at your high res iframe codec like prores 422 prores 4444 4, 4, 4, something like that and then run it back through media encoder to get your h264 values <clears throat> I'll try that in the future. Yeah. I've, I've just always done the animation codec. Uh, because you're, you yeah, you're going to find out that you can save a, you keep the same quality and save a ton of space by going with something like ProRes. Yeah, I've got backup graphs filled with MOV power. Yeah, and you can even, I mean, you can even go as, as long as you have uh, enough space to keep the media that you encode, you can always take your animation files and just cross or transcode them to something like ProRes and um, then delete the animation codec and yes. you'll you'll save yourself, I don't know, that'll take up a quarter of the space that animation codec takes up. And it's less expensive, less taxing on your system to play back. So something like animation or like an uncompressed 10 bit or some, something like that will be really difficult to play back on your system. Um, slow it down, cause hiccups, drop frames, <coughs> but something like ProRes 422 doesn't cause so many problems. Yes? Do you still, is compressor still a, a thing? It is. <laughs> I think it's 50 bucks or something like that in the App Store. Does anybody use Sorensen? Sorensen Squeeze. Do you do you steal? I I think that's also a good compression that. software. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I haven't used it in a long time. I mean, you, is that what you use? Um, when I when I make like play blasts or whatever, mm -hmm. I use Sorensen, and I just thought you guys had an opinion on it, like that's terrible. Something like that. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> I just wanted to know. Not terrible. It is only a uh, choice. It's yeah. only a choice. Yeah. Okay. If it works for you, that's yeah. great. I think there was, it seemed like years ago there was a time when like a third party like Swarm Center or something like that it seemed like the best way to go. Because mm -hmm. I think you can still make you save those out to like a WMD file if, if for whatever reason you want to put such a thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but being in the Apple world, I mean, I think it was very, there was a lot of options. And stuff like that. So before we move on, any Windows folks in here and your preferred codecs, what's your codec you use? I always save my videos out as H.264. Okay. Um, yeah. Anybody well, else? For, for me, uh, my workflow kind of changes a little bit from time to time, but I, I actually output image sequences. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of the stuff I do, I actually output a JPEG sequence, but bump the quality of it up to an eight or a nine out of 10. 11, probably 11. So yeah, 11. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it's a, it's, it creates a small file size, but you don't get artifacting or anything mm -hmm. really if you have a high enough you know, setting on there. And then for stuff that I need, that I want you know, as high of quality, lossless as possible, I, I found uh, a TIFF sequence, yeah. uh, but with uh, under your codec options, mm -hmm. check the LZW compression, and it like drastically cuts the the file size down. Mm -hmm. And uh, Premiere likes it because uh, you know I'm bringing all this stuff into Premiere, and so you're playing back your image sequences in Premiere. Yes. Okay. So wow. um, you know Premiere will take it. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, put it all together yeah. as a as an actual clip. But uh, Premiere will play JPEG sequences pretty much no problem. Um, the TIFF sequences it'll play no problem. If I need an alpha channel too, uh, that's when I'll do the uh, the TIFF sequence. Um, but PNG sequences, uh, our Premiere does not like PNG sequences for some reason. Okay. So. I I really like PNG with. An alpha channel, but yeah. you know, also TIFF is, yeah. is good if you need an yeah. alpha channel. Real quick. Yep. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, I was just going to say, like, 
the technique I tend to use is render to animation and then uh, H.264 to compress. And You're going to get a great looking H.264 if you do that. But you're also going to take up a lot of space on your drive. Yeah. I have a question for just everybody. Is like, do any of y'all use dynamic linking? Like, if you're working in Premiere, bringing in the dynamic links. Yes. After Effects comp. I love doing that. Does it, does it, does it work pretty well for you? Yeah, it, it yeah. works super well because um, I can just like I have an animation. I had a recently. I had an animation where it was just a block of text that was being animated, mm -hmm. and my client kept tweaking and changing how they wanted to what they wanted to say. Yeah. So I just. I literally just linked just one aspect of it. I think it was opacity when I wasn't even changing that, just to link it. I had it over in Essential Graphics, and every time I wanted to change it, I would just delete it out of the timeline, go back to After Effects, make the change, save the project, and then just tell it to the relink. Mm -hmm. And then in Premiere, just drag it back down again. Gotcha. There's no exporting, no nothing. It's just seamless, and it, it's real nice. So is that your workflow usually? Is just, you know, uh, keep everything your master, so to speak, in <laughs> Premiere, and then just edit in After Effects? Well, so with Essential Graphics, it like, they're, you know, they're both, there's Essential Graphics in After Effects and Essential Graphics in, it's like a portal basically in each. Mm -hmm. And once you save in After Effects, it just shows up in Premiere. Premiere. It just updates. They're linked together behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, with Essential Graphics, you should be able to change the text. You color, can. Colors and, I, and change your fonts or your, your text out and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and you can link as many of the Aspects of it as you want, but it only takes one to link them okay. together. So, yeah. very good. Gotcha. Uh, so, we were talking about image sequences. <clears throat> so, we'll go look over here at <clears throat> the frame default here is in PNG still. <clears throat> so, if I drop down to PNG still and I hit edit, then you'll see that I have PNG sequence set, just the video output. I have RGB plus alpha, and uh, you know if your format has any or your codec has any uh, options, you can get those there. And just some other uh, general settings, and I set that as my frame default. So anytime I go from composition to uh, save frame as file like that. Then it comes in and it automatically does the still with the PNG still there. Uh, so also I have a ProRes SD, and the ProRes SD crops. So if I have a um, typically what I'll have, let's I'll show you this. So this is 1920 by 1080. It doesn't necessarily do the math for me. So if I go back, I'm going to hit uh, Command Option 0 to go to my render queue. And you'll see here that I cut with my crop. I'll cut um, 240 pixels left, 240 pixels right, and I get my SD frame size. Oh. 4 by 3. 4 by, yeah. Aspect ratio this is four by three, and so then if I have this set up to do ProRes SD, uh, I can also maybe let's say just set one of these to ProRes 422 and then do an additional output module. Sorry, an additional output module, and the um, maybe we can. Come over here and drop in a. I'm gonna hit Option and click through here. And we'll, sorry, I'm gonna double click this, and drop that in, and we'll do a little rotate so we can see a uh, difference in this. We'll change this to black. Keep it inside. I want to keep it inside my title and action safe because when I crop it, then I'll lose it otherwise. And so if I go back to my render queue. I hit sorry, go back to my render queue and I hit render. 
it's rendering this one movie, but it is actually because I have two output modules, it is creating two movies at the same time. They're the same thing. Just open them in QuickTime. What shortcut did you just use to do that? It's a command and minus. Well, really? I never knew about that one. So this is the same movie rendered into two, or the same comp rendered into two movies at the same time with this one cropped. Okay? And uh, here's another tip for you inside QuickTime Player. If you hit Command and Return, it plays both movies at the same time. Whoa! <laughs> Mm -hmm. What was that again? Command and return. <laughs> there was something I wanted to mention about rendering to PNG image sequence, and that is that PNGs are basically compressed without any loss. So you have a lossless image with some compression. Okay. So that'd be a reason why you might want to render to PNG. Okay. Get yeah. the cleanest, crispest image that way. Yeah. So just to kind of recap here, one comp, and you can have as many output modules as you want. Um, and there's another little tip for you. This twirling this down shows you where you rendered to. Something I do a lot because I work on a lot of projects during the week is I'll render something and then go set another render up and it'll render to the same folder as my yeah. previous <laughs> render oh, yeah. and I will have forgotten what I rendered yeah. the, hidden five the previous files day. Yeah. Yeah. So what I can do is if I have my uh, output module still in here from my render, I can <coughs> twirl down and just click on it and it reveals it for me. Can you briefly go over your FFmpeg terminal workflow? Is it just... Yeah, I'll, so I, I won't be able to go over the full thing. I can kind of talk to you about what we do, mm -hmm. but uh, I can show you a couple things in FFmpeg. Um, so you have to you have to download FFmpeg and then you just you know, use terminal to control it. Correct. Okay. So uh, what he is talking about is this over here. This is a terminal, and I'm just going to open a new terminal window and. Uh, there are some, some couple of hoops you have to jump through to be able to use the FFmpeg compression in the terminal. Uh, but one of them is homebrew, and it's pretty easy. And then the other, I'll just type it out here so you know what it looks like, homebrew. And uh, the other is just installing with homebrew FFmpeg. Uh, which is an open source encoding software inside the terminal. And uh, FF String Clip uses it. Uh, Handbrake, if you remember Handbrake, mm -hmm. Handbrake uses FFmpeg. And um, so I have. <clears throat> you said you needed Homebrew to install it? You don't need Homebrew, but Homebrew makes it easy. So let me see if I can find my... Is that because FFmpeg is a DOS tool? It is a Unix tool. It's a Unix, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have, man. I wonder if I still have that stuff in here. Uh, we would have... And I had at some point a this is how you install FFmpeg in Basecamp. Um, and if you guys really, you know, if you want to go a little further into it, we can talk about it. That's fine. Uh, and what, would you, what are the advantages of, of doing it that way? So uh, with FFmpeg, you can launch multiple encodes at the same time. Uh, you can get a little more granular 
if you want to spend the time with the encoding process. And so I'll just kind of walk you through what it looks like. Uh, remember, we're in the terminal. I don't expect you to know exactly what's going on in the terminal. You can research and kind of figure out what's going on. Um, but I will go here to my, let's see, I think I'm on my desktop. No. Pipe, no. Um, go. Let me actually see if I can, oh, I need to change CD, change directory to my desktop. And I'll list and see if this is where my <coughs> After Effects user group stuff is. Okay, there it is. So I'll CD into my After Effects user group. And I want to change directory to 2018. I think that's what it is. Let's see. Look, we'll list it in yeah, 2018 February. So change directory 2018 February. that there's my renders folder change directory to renders and there are my files <clears throat> comp one and one one so then I can call ffmpeg like this ffmpeg input and I'll do just that first comp dot mov and I'm hitting tab if I know that something can be completed by ffmpeg like a command or folder name or something I can hit tab or file name, and it'll if if it doesn't have any confusing things in that folder or structure, then it'll just go ahead and complete it for me. Uh, and I want to do that's my input movie, and I want to maybe I'll say size is going to be 1280 by 720, and my codec for video is going to be libx264 that I've installed with FFmpeg. And maybe my bitrate for video is going to be um, 4500K. And I need to do PIX format, YUV420P. That is uh, required by QuickTime in order to play back the video. Otherwise, just you won't be able to see what's going on and there are other things I can do I can crop I can scale um, I can do watermarks and pipe various you know um, videos together and do uh, change file size or frame sizes and stack videos on top of each other that are all kind of mapped inside FFmpeg so it's a pretty powerful thing and you can copy these like recipes like into some other text documents so yeah. you can just sort of yeah. correct. Actually I'll show you some things that I have up here. I was gonna say the advantage of using a command line tool like this too is you can create bash scripts that can that can almost like little mini programs that yeah. you can call that application, have it do certain things based on the parameters and spell your results. So yeah. It may seem cumbersome to be typing all these parameters by hand, but if you think about it from a scripting perspective, you can automate a lot of things just by calling scripts that call that application through command line right. commands. And so I've got some thumbnail stuff here. I've got watermarking with audio, um, two-pass encoding, and then a crop. Here and it's so the it's kind of fun that I can actually say instead of uh, 1440 in there as my 
crop width, I can actually say my in width, and then uh, I think it's times four divided by three. I can actually put that math into this. So if my input width is 1920, then it crops it to 1440. If my input width is 1280, it crops it to 960. And I don't have to add those numbers every time. I can just put the math in there and it does that for me. Uh, so then uh, in here, I'll show you this last little bit. I just need to put my output name. So I'll do comp one, maybe like h264 dot mov or mp4 and I hit go and it does the compression come out here and look there's my movie and there's my compressed movie and you can see that there's a little bit of loss there in my saturation right um, and I think that I don't know if it's the libx264 codec or if it's h264 just in general but um, that's a pretty strong pink to be dealing with anyway. Um, and just as a, a little bit of a, an example of what you can do, I have some files here and I'll show you my, I uh, have a, a droplet here that is created with um, script editor. It's the script editor for this one because I use Apple Script here. And I got the wrong one. What? Did it move much stuff around? No, that should be it. Should be it. <clears throat> Let's open that. Well, what is going on? I don't even know. Let's see if I just drop this on there. It says, what do you want your... Uh, I have a little script window that popped up. Select my frame and press continue. So I can select a thumbnail frame and then go back to this and hit continue and it fires off a bunch of FF MPEG things. That's what you do. Yeah. Right. So this is this is the FF MPEG command that it did for this is a bunch of 640 by 480 movies. It's looking at the SD. Uh, it pulled the name here of the HD, cropped that off, and then it went looking for the SD, and it remembers the frame here that I picked, provides that to FFmpeg, and it pulls these um, thumbnail frames, and after it does the PNG, because of a kind of a chroma actual shift that JPEG saving out does from the terminal. I save it out as a PNG and then go back and find it and convert it to a JPEG when it's done. Uh, it also, so it looks in this folder, it does something with all these names and if I have multi-screen uh, files then it finds, it either creates or finds these folders and so there, there are my JPEGs now there's the HD and the SD, and I have this uploads folder, and it is creating all of these files with the correct naming convention based on that base name that I had before. Um, and all of this we have now moved off of my plate necessarily, and it's going to be done on the server which is pretty cool that FFmpeg, you just give it arguments and you can run it from wherever as long as it knows how to see the files and where to put them. It can go off and do that. Uh, and things like compressor and um, 
Adobe Media Encoder, those kind of things aren't as scriptable as that kind of stuff. So you can see that it rendered all those movies and that's the process for doing the PNGs and JPEGs. And now we have these two new files and all of these There's one with the watermark. Oh, that's rad. So, uh, and when, you just created a droplet to do all that. Uh huh. Wow. And I'm not sure why it's not loading up in the uh, script editor. So, uh, that's one of my crowning achievements <laughs> in my life is that I was able to get all that to happen with dropping one file on one droplet. That was awesome. very, very pleasing <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah. You would have drug them over yeah, each one, Mary. So <laughs> the other um, advantage of using a command or a, a terminal app like FFmpeg is it's light on overhead because it's just doing what you need it to do. It's yeah. not, you don't have a graphical interface that's taking system resources. It's not, yeah. you know, so that's another advantage of kind of going command line. With that kind of a thing, is you just needed to do something. You don't need all the extra. You don't need the fluff, and it's it's very it's quite cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. external command thing. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. And it, you know, it's not the most intuitive thing in the world, especially if you're not a programmer. <laughs> but there's a reasonable community online, people that if if you can probably think of it to do with a movie or still, somebody else has thought of it. And can probably help you get to your result. So, um, if you want to look more into it, talk more about it, I would love to. Chad um, Gilmore, who's in our group, also loves talking about <laughs> FFmpeg. <laughs> so, uh, I'll be very happy to move you in the right direction for that. While we're talking about the terminal, there is also something you need to know about if you didn't know already. And that is, if you go to your applications, there's a little app called AE Render. And AE Render is a background renderer, a terminal Unix renderer for After Effects. <clears throat> if you look under Help, and I wonder if we can find it here. Results found. Let's go to um, let's just go to After Effects Help Online. And we will search a render. <clears throat> Man, there's one of my favorite words. <laughs> Boom, right there, automating rendering with AE Render. It is a little executable, and this tells you where to get to it on your system, Mac or Windows, and how to fire off a simple render. So you have a call, like we did with uh, FFmpeg, you have a call for AE Render. You have to actually tell the terminal where to look. Um, then you have the project. So we had the dash I was our input for FFmpeg. That's what you do here. You do the project and you give it a project path, which is something that's pretty cool is that if you're gonna do it, you can just find your project um, out here. Let's see if I can find project real quick. And there's one right there. If I just drag it into my terminal, that's the path. Okay, so I don't have to figure out how to type it all in. I can just call AE Render and drag the file in, and it's it knows where to look for it. Okay. Are you guys familiar with the term, terminal command where if After Effects is freezing up, it'll uh, save a copy and then force quit. That's a good one too. That one, do you know it offhand or? Eh, it's like, no, just Google it. Yeah, it's like there's a, something. yeah, 
that's that's a very good one as well. You have to look, you have to open up. I mean, it's an, a Mac thing. I'm not sure about for Windows, but you look in um, Activity Monitor and you can see the ID for the application, and then you say basically okay, what the process ID. Exactly? The process ID, yeah. It saved my bacon a few times. Digital sandwich that one works too. Yeah. It's like what's the one build where you just the PID or no yeah. kill. Yeah, it's kill PID. Save it as what it is in the end as pass now. I'm sorry, neighbor. Yeah, so what you would do is find your process ID in mm -hmm. your terminal, sorry, in your uh, activity monitor. And then you just type this in. And, we, you know, of course, we need to say why. If After Effects is freezing, the spinning wheel of death is going on, uh, then you maybe you hadn't saved in a little while and you don't want to lose all your work. This is where you do that. What it'll do is, I think this is one, uh, it'll save and quit. <clears throat> So if you just search that kind of thing right there, then you'll get all the wonderful help for that. Uh, but anyway, back to here. You can even, in this thing, so you load your project. And if you know your comp names and you have a bunch of them in uh, your render queue, I think it works only if you have your render queue populated. Uh, I, I know that if you have your render queue populated, it'll just render everything in your render queue. Uh, I don't know, maybe this is saying that you can specify a comp to render here. And it'll drop that in the render queue with your default settings and render it. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, what about all the other settings? I'm going to let you go through those yourself. <laughs> uh, what I will tell you is that if you have just a little bit of gumption, you can, let's see, I'll let me show you with this guy here. So let's uh, um, go back to our Rangers folder, we'll dump these guys like that, and drop this back in here. And I'm going to save this project as 2018 Feb. And uh, I'm going to back to my finder. And I have a droplet here. If I drop this project on my droplet, it loads up. After Effects and goes off rendering and look at me, I'm still working in After Effects. That's awesome. Okay. Whoa, whoa. And you can look over here and see the renders folder. There it is. It's going. And um, I can even, if I have multiple projects and I don't have a whole lot of overhead between my projects, I can grab them, drop them on, grab them, drop them on. And uh, with my um, operating system, my Mac operating system, I can set up a hotkey, which I have done for this guy. And I don't know if I have anything that I can just render right now in 2014. But if I select, I'll, I'll show what it looks like. It'll, it'll fail. But um, I select this. AEP, and I hit my hotkey, I got set up, then it takes that After Effects project, gives it to this automator file, and launches it in my terminal to render. Also, there's not, it's not quite advanced, but you can also uh, launch multiple versions of After Effects while at the same time, you know, not that one. Not, well, so, so tell me how you do it. So you go to the application, go to After Effects, in here? Uh, just in your finder. Yeah. And so now right click on your app and say show package contents. 
Okay. Yeah, and you go contents, Mac OS, and then double click on After Effects. So that's going to render a, sec a second copy. So now you could have two copies. I don't know why you'd want to, but um, but I mean, it, but it would it, that's fourteen, but it would be like the same. It's just yeah. another um, another, not it's quite a sexy, but yeah. yeah, another instance of the same. Another instance yeah. of it sitting out there yeah. for you to use. Yeah, so this one failed because it was not using the correct version of After Effects. But this guy went all the way through and rendered my comp. <coughs> there we go. In the background. And uh, I'm just going to show you the automator. So I got my items, pass it to this guy here. And that's really all it is. I get, I tell it where to find the AE render script with the folder path, and then give it the path to the input that is getting through the droplet. And then that is the script right there. So uh, I could even just go like that and then project, and then the file path for that project. Let's do it. Let me go out here and delete that guy. Go to the terminal, and there, hit, type in project. And then drop that in like that. Hit render. Again, go to not a. So I need to escape this. Got my spaces in there. That ain't good. Escape out. There we go. So this is. Probably a little more of a deep dive than you guys were looking for on here, but that's how you get to be able to use the AE render. Um, and there's enough documentation out there to get you started, and you don't have to spend 30 or 40 bucks on the background render script in whoever selling it on my yeah, AE script. Uh, you can just <clears throat> do it yourself. Launch a bunch of background rendering and get your stuff done quick. So uh, let us do one more thing here. I'm going to just set up a little rotation on this. Fancy rotation. And we're going to do a uh, render a sequence, an image sequence. I'll go up here, this, and I'll say multi-machine settings. It's basically my best settings, but it should have that checked. Let's see if it'll check it if I do multi-machine sequence here. It's going to be a TIFF. Maybe I'll make it a PNG sequence. And now if I go back here, see, uh, skip existing files is checked. And if I just render that, it'll just go through clicking each next frame. Uh, if I save it and do my droplet here, and then do my droplet, and then do my droplet. I'm launching three instances of After Effects. And once these other two guys load, you'll see how it's skipping frames. Let's say skipping, skipping. And if I look here, it's populating this folder pretty rapidly. Cool. With all these files. So is it safe to say then that the, <coughs> the command line render is not multi-threading? 
using just a single CPU. Uh, so you can run more than one, two, I cannot two cannot speak to that. I don't know if it uses the the preferences that you have in After Effects, um, because you can set After Effects up to use you know a certain number of yeah. cores and all that. <clears throat> well, I'm just wondering what the advantage of running three instances is if that's not true. Because if that's true, then you are mm -hmm. occupying different CPU cycles, you know, whatever. I pardon mm -hmm. my lack of technical lingo, but you know, like. If each one of these instances is is, is on a single <coughs> CPU, whatever you want to call it, yeah. then it is multi-threading your render. Yeah. <coughs> and so you will get a faster render. However, if it's not, if it's if it's using all four cores, if it's a four core one instance, then you're not really saving any you're not you're not increasing your render speed. Oh, that's that's not not true. True. You're saying they're all multi-threaded. Yeah. Not accomplishing. <clears throat> yeah. They're all I, the I will say that you can get to the point if you set up enough of these guys rendering, you can get to the point where you're slowing yourself down. Okay. Yeah. Then I would assume that they're each. But I think they're yeah. I think they're core or whatever. Differently, differently threaded. Yeah. To the CPUs. Um. But I'm not sure how that works. I'm not sure if it's in this guy here that you can set up um, your your core. Uh, how how many of the cores each one uses, or what? That'd be interesting to you know. Like if you yeah. have a if you have a simple quad core, you can only run four of those. You know, yeah. If you have a sixteen core. Yep. 16 instances, then above that, you're kind of diminishing your returns. Yes, I agree with that. Affecting you. So it's, it's good to know your system if you're going to do this, or at least you know try it out and see at what point you run out of um, benefit yeah. through it. But, Would yes, this apply to the render farm also? Could you have these and the render farm? Yes. So... When you say render farm, I mean like there's 20 Macs in here. Yes. And then each each Mac could be running two or three of these, and so if you have if you have a bunch of machines that all have the same plugins, that all have the same fonts, and are all in the same version of After Effects, and can all see the same server and the same folder, then you could do let's say 12 machines. Three or four of these each, and destroy a render. You'd be the <laughs> render destroyer. <laughs> I was just wow. The and possibilities are limited. <laughs> and, and I would bet that there is a way to script that so you could control it all with one. With one drive. one dialogue yeah. box. Yeah. You might be able to do that. Whoa. Or or it's just mind <laughs> 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 blown. Mind blown. Mind blown. Who has twenty boxes at their disposal? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. there you I'm go. Sure they have, <laughs> yeah, they have. I'm sure they have. Oh, more about it. We'll talk more about it. Totes. All right. Now, uh, we did. I, I'm going to let you guys do Media Encoder, Adobe Media Encoder on your own. That's another efficiency that you can look at rendering in Adobe Media Encoder. Um, while, and I, I'm just in my limited experience with media encoder, uh, I think that when you go to render an after effects project in media encoder, it will, uh, render one comp at a time. I don't think, and can anybody correct me on that? I don't think you can render three or four at a time. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, do it I, I rarely do that because I find I'm more likely to get a glitch yeah. in the end product if okay. I go through a media encoder versus just outputting through the right. render. Oh, yeah. oh really? Yeah. Not not a lot, but but there's a possibility. A handful of times. Do you ever okay. do what he's talking about where you run around and then put it through media encoder and that's fine or? Uh, yeah, if I'm just doing like a, a you know straight file into media, <clears throat> enco media encoder, I don't I usually don't have any problems doing that. Oh, that's not But, oh, but yeah. like, um, 
Yeah, if I, from the After Effects menu, if like if you do, you know, send to uh, send to from send send your send After Effects to project to Media Encoder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've encountered a couple of times where I've had you know a glitch or something in the video where it, or it made my machine crash or whatever. Good to know. All right, so I'm going to intentionally destroy this file. <gasps> or, oh, Dang, you saved it. <laughs> yeah, so we can figure out which one it is. Did I save it? Maybe I saved it as a PSD, huh? Oh, gave an error. It's sort of by date month. Photoshop. Command two again. Yeah, all right, so it's junked up. And it is frame 202. So I rendered out an image sequence, and that saves my bacon a little bit. Because if I were to take this, let's say, uh, go back here like this, and load this image sequence in. I can look at my frame numbers here, and go to 202, and there's my crummy frame. Um, I don't want that. So what I'm gonna do is delete these guys out of here, go back to my comp and say, I'm gonna use my multi-machine settings, which includes this skip existing files. There's 202, I'm just gonna delete 202. And just inside After Effects, I'm gonna hit render. Like that. And if I go now. Don't you just love that sound? Yes, yeah, so it, it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> Magic is completed. If I go look here at 202, it is fixed. It's fixed. Uh, okay. So that, that can help you in After Effects, that can help you in Cinema 4D. Uh, I think most folks I have come across render image sequences out of Cinema 4D. Um, I don't know if this is a that's interesting What's the thing. Yes, because, because you can go back and just fix blocks of frames instead of having to re-render yeah. your so, entire Yeah, or say, say the client comes in and says, oh, the, the last half of, of the shot, I need it to be green instead of pink. Mm -hmm. Well, then you can just figure out what frame number that is and just re-output that in, you know, the yeah. segment. The other thing I like doing image sequences too is because if it does crash while I'm rendering, I still have every... Every frame that it's rendered up to that up point to that is point, still yeah. intact. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Where's that checkbox? Is it under output? Or? So you have under, uh, sorry, let me duplicate that. And under render settings, multi machine, sorry. It's, yeah. whoa. <laughs> bah! Restart. Multi machine settings. Okay. This is under uh, render settings. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's this box here. Gotcha. And this multi-machine settings for my output module is just for yeah. whatever image sequence I have it set up to do. Um, okay, 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 okay. Something that Pete brought up at dinner. If you guys missed being at dinner, I'm very sad that you missed dinner. We always have great conversation. At dinner. At dinner. So we're gonna look at Post haste from Digital Rebellion. And you can examine this to your heart's content. I recommend looking really deeply at it. But it is a free app that you can download for Mac and Windows. Uh, I always get a little bit frustrated when people call a Windows machine a PC because Mac is also a PC, because PC stands for personal, personal computer. computer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Mac is a Mac and a Windows is a Windows. No. no. You're both PC. short. Yeah. PC. So uh, what Post Haste does, and I love using Post Haste, uh, is 
gives you the ability to set up templates for your uh, projecting. So at the beginning of a project, uh, I have set up here a series of folders, assets folders, renders folders, uploads, and an After Effects template. And when I create this, I go to New Project, and I say uh, AE Group, like that. Uh, I can have a project number, I can have date, whoever the creator is, and I can say what parts of those I want to use in my template. I typically only use just the project name. I don't care, uh, but Pete, Pete, there's Pete. Pete likes to date everything. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at least that's what they said about him in college. If you know what I mean. <laughs> so I hit create project. And then I'll go to my Graceway working, hit save. And if we look over here, then I have created a project called AE Group in a folder called AE Group. My assets, renders, uploads. And when I open this project, I have, because I have it set up for uh, 2014, I have a folder called Render These. No editing, assets, pre comp and original comps, all with my labeling set up, and the file name is AE Group. So if you have a specific thing that you need to, that you know, if that's your happy place when you create a project, you know you're going to have these six folders, or you know that these things are going to be named this, and you know that you're going to need a Premiere Pro project with these folders, or a final, I think it, it does Final Cut Pro. And it'll do seven. I don't know if it'll do ten. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then After Effects projects with whatever. And really, all this does is <clears throat> gives you the ability to create a project with whatever in it. So you could have interstitials and intros and outros, <clears throat> movies, and all that stuff already set up in your default locations. You s put them all in this project window and you save that as your template and every time you create a new project it'll name or version or whatever that project for you and give you all of your files folders pre comps that you already want to have in there that is a huge not only efficiency but also consistency consistency mm -hmm. uh, saver um, so that's uh, that's big for me um, it's called Post Haste, and it's from Digital Rebellion. Is it free or is it free? It's free. Yeah. So as soon as you work on a team, you know, guys that label things differently, it just creates havoc when you have to go back and find something. You're like, where the where the point that was at? Yeah. yeah. How do you guys establish your sort of subdirectories? Yeah, just like <coughs> to call it something assets yeah. versus photos, or that's just whatever makes you feel good about yourself. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a religious question more than... Yeah, uh, existential. Yeah. It kind of existential. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do it. This is just the way I do it. Uh, so here's another tip for you on your Mac. If you hold this down right here, it shows you all the places you've been. And so I'm going to go back to... And I go, where's my window that I was in earlier? So, I didn't change windows. I just opened a new one. Um, so those are all the other wonderful places I've been. Uh, let's see now. With Trent, do you know about the um, file open or file save as dialog? <coughs> Open or if you go to save a file and you're gonna have to navigate to only different folders down and up and over to the other server. Uh -huh. If you have that same window open or that same location open in Finder, you can just drag mm -hmm. and put onto your file dialog. Yep. Mm -hmm. So let's let's show that. So let's say I want to save this to a different location. 
and it's going to be that right there. Uh, and it is way dug down in a, a place that I don't want to have to navigate to, but I'm going to navigate there anyway, just for your benefit. And we'll go uh, here and here, here and here and here and here. So in order to get to there, um, I can grab this folder like that and drag it into my save dialog and it takes me to that folder. You can grab, you can grab any folder or file in that, yeah. in that dialog, not just the one at the top of the window. So also, if I want to name my file this right here, I can grab here and drag it like that. <clears throat> and it'll change the name. And you can do that with any dialog uh, in the Mac OS. I'm not sure about Windows. Yeah, on Windows, you, there's a there's a path bar at the top. Yeah. yeah. And you go into your Windows Copy Explorer, that. Copy that. Copy that. Okay. Paste it into your dialog box. Not quite as friendly, but. But still available. Yes. Yeah. But basically, if you're there already in your file explorer, yeah. Yeah. you can copy that real quick. Yeah. Instead of having to navigate that by hand. Yeah. yeah. I do that all the time. That's good. All right. So let's say uh, we're going to create, we'll just do a new project or a new comp here and create a nice little window. Oh, no, let's do. That. I'm sure those two colors go well together. <clears throat> but my anchor point for this shape layer that I've created is way down here. And if I'm going to rotate it, it's going to rotate around like that. Uh, but I want this to be centered up. So typically what I do when I create a shape layer is just double click like that and it fills the frame. And then I resize it as needed. <laughs> because that goes ahead and puts the anchor point right in the middle. <clears throat> if my anchor point is not in the middle, I can do Option, Command, Home, and it puts the anchor point in the middle. And then if I do Command, Home, it centers up the object with the anchor point on the center of the comp. Is that just for shape layers? Uh, no, it works for text. So. Like Does it work for video layers? It works for video layers. Okay. So I'm going to go like that and like that. So it's Option Command on the Mac, it's Option Command Home, and on the Windows it's Alt Control Home, I believe. There's a few plugins you can use, like Motion 2, where it has like a little like kind of anchor point, so you can put it in the upper left, upper right, mm -hmm. or wherever, and you can adjust your anchor point. I use those quite a bit. Yeah, yeah it's good. Uh, what we probably, I think something might be fun is for everyone to kind of bring uh, like a set of scripts or something that they enjoy. Maybe we'll do that next month. You just say, um, on, when I do the uh, meeting notes or the meeting event, if you just put in there what you're going to come talk about, then... Um, I don't know if I would download everything to my system, but we could at least maybe open up AE scripts and, sure. and talk about stuff. We have to talk <laughs> about VX console. Yeah. I, that's it's basically it's like Safari or uh, Spotify or not Spotify, uh, Spotlight or Alfred, which you're using. Yep. But in After Effects, in so After you can Effect. use a hotkey and then you can access any effect. I use that all the time. Just, Is that the one from Andrew Kramer, Video yeah. Copilot? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, um, that right there is the centering of the anchor point. And, like, um, I'll just put a solid in there. And let's do like that. Let's see what happens. Option, command, home, centers that up. And then we center that up on the. So it works on masks or solids with masks, and then it works 
works on polygons. So let's do this like that. And center, center. And triangles. So we can do <clears throat> there with my polystar. Do it three sides and then hey, look at there, it's already centered up. Oh my god. Man, I gotta use that last week. <laughs> You're welcome, Jonathan. You're welcome. I was almost going over to lie and like You should have come to this meeting before last week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, something that I really like is clouds. Clouds. I really like clouds. Uh, I'm gonna go get some stuff. Do I want stock footage? No, I don't want stock footage. I want some <coughs> movies and where do I go to find movies? How about we do photos? Let's put some photos in here and I'm drag that folder in and it puts all the photos in. And let's say I want to let's say I want to transition between each of these photos. But I don't want to open each one of them and set my opacity. And then go here and set my opacity to zero. I can even, you know, if I want to, I can copy and paste here like that. Twirl that down and see that I did that. And then I have to line them all up. So what I'm going to do get rid of all that and I'm going to overlap these by going animation keyframe assist no uh, sequence layers yes keyframe assistant sequence layers I'm gonna overlap and I can do a transition that dissolves the front layer and hit OK oh, I have to actually overlap them <laughs> So I want the overlap duration to be. <laughs> and now. Okay, so I've. That is gosh darn beautiful. So I've got my transitions like that. That's that's Cadillac Ranch. I'm, that's one of my pictures I'm most proud of in my. Arsenal. Uh, so I've done that and I've got my uh, opacity change, but maybe let's say I'm going to rearrange those things. So I'm going to come over here to my effects and presets panel and do fade in. And if I look here, I have fade in out frames and milliseconds. So I'm going to do fade in out frames. Just double click that and it applies it to all of these guys. And then. Does that I, apply to any effect? It applies to any layer. Okay. Any layer. So, any layer, if you have a whole bunch of layers selected, can be double clicked and applied to all the layers you have? Okay. Correct. Good. You can select one, apply it to one, select all, apply it to all. Thank goodness. And then I can. Let's, let me go back here and take it off of there. And I'm going to do in out frames like that. So the default is 15 frames. With all of them selected after I have applied this, I can come in here and do 30 and 30 like that. And I believe it's going to have, yeah, it applied it to all of them. So we've got some goofiness happening here. I don't want one minute. I'm going to do 20 seconds. So now, if I just kind of disperse these layers, I can have a fade in, fade out happening. There is a way, I'm sure there's a way to do everything. There's a way to do but everything. There's like a, 
I, th I think it's something where you, you click all the layers and then you hit the alignment and then it can cascade where you don't have to manually. No, that's it, yeah. So if I animate keyframe assistant sequence layers, I will not do overlap. Uh, no, 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 I will do overlap. Mm -hmm. One second, but I'm not gonna do the dissolve that time. Okay. Like that. And I can, with expressions, I can link up these things and say, like, instead of the uh, fade in, I just want the fade out. So I'll link that up to here, set that to zero, and copy the expression only. And Can apply that to all of those guys like that. So now instead of fading in, it's just the top ones fading out. Of course, there's a cut there because of it doesn't fade in. But so fade in, fade out frames, and then if I don't like where that transition happens, I can just scoot this down here. It's dynamic. And it, yeah, it's dynamic because it's looking at, it's using an expression to look at the out point <clears throat> right there. It's looking at the out point <clears throat> of the <clears throat> layer. And it's working based on the length of the layer instead of keyframes. The relevant length. Not just, not just the actual end point, you know, right? It is the actual out point of the layer minus however many frames I told it yeah. to do the dissolve. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's always a uh, relative 30 frames yeah. to the, where the thing ends. So if I stretch it out, it doesn't make the dissolve longer. Yeah. <clears throat> keeps the dissolve the same length, but changes where it happens. Have you ever okay. made presets that involve expressions? Yes, yeah. and they are awesome. I mean, we don't have to do that rabbit hole, I'm just curious. That's actually one of my, my, my just, last thing on reality. here was to talk about um, creating your own presets. So you wanna do that now? Do you mind if I ask just one quick question? Please. It's not related. You know, I had a situation recently where I had a bunch of images of varying dimensions and resolutions. Is there a simple way to set those all to the exact same width? Set them to the same width or set like, them to the, the comp width? Well, uh, no, set them to any width, but so they're all identical widths. Because, like, at different sizes, you know, the, if they're going to show up as, as the same width, that's going to be a different percentage for each one because they're all different mm -hmm. resolutions. I don't know if there's a simple way to, like, I need them all to be a third wide or you know, a third of the. Well, yeah, there's like you can that. certainly fit to comp <clears throat> size. So I imagine there's probably more than you can right, but I have one where width. I need to like tile a bunch of them around. Uh, I want them all to be the same width for their different dimensions <clears throat> oh, and I resolutions. So I, didn't, and I, I just eyeballed it one by one and got through it, but like I thought this way to say. I mean, maybe what seven. you could do is set your composition size to whatever width you want it to be, then fit them all to that width, oh, and then you could just smart. redistribute them mm -hmm. after you change the comp size back up. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Or or set them all in the same comp with the correct width, and then duplicate the comp and delete them individually out. Mm -hmm. Or read the comp number. So if you create a comp here that is what is this comp two? Call this <clears throat> picks one like that, and then I would say uh, if. Uh, layer, Let's see I need to get the comp name. How would I get the comp name? This comp name. It looks like the name of this comp is comp1. Yep, uh, let's see, n equals this comp name, and then if 
index equals that uh, in 100 else 0. And then maybe that just becomes 1 like that. <clears throat> and then I would copy that expression to everyone else. And we can say select all, set the width like that. And then one, two, three, four, seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if we look at the thumbnail up there, it has awesome. shown me. So in, in comp three, it doesn't show me any of these layers. It only shows me the third layer. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Well, so, why would you want to do this? <laughs> well, uh, I have a. Uh, I have an expression that I use for my church's Lord's Supper slides. And the text, I pulled the text from somewhere else in my, uh, my project that is a, it's kind of an eval. It looks at a bunch of um, arrays. And the arrays have Bible verse and uh, reference. And the next one has Bible verse and reference, Bible verse reference. But they are in the array such that if I have comp one, it'll look at the first array, um, the first position in the array for the verse, and the f first position in the array for the reference. And because I have it set up like that, if I just need to change one or two things, I change it in the um, the text area, and then I either it either updates in my uh, my comps, or I just duplicate or remove comps, and if the comp reads what's my name, it includes a number. That number goes into the array and says, "Read this thing, and give me the text for that thing, and animate it this way." I think. So I set up one, get all the animation like I need it, and then just duplicate them and they replace the text based on what comp number it is. Yeah. That's if we're just creating little like single clips of them and then you might um, rearrange and some kind of larger presentation. Yeah. I mean I'm sure there are multiple uses for it, but that's the one I came up with. Um, all right. So Mary. We're gonna look at this one more time. Go slow. Go slow. Okay. So I have a bunch of layers here and I want to be able to uh, size them in my comp get the correct size for them and then once they're all the correct size duplicate my comp multiple times and instead of going back into each comp so I'll go into comp 1 and delete all these guys go into comp 2 sorry Go into comp two and delete everything but comp two, right? That's how I. That's the the manual way of making sure that I only have one of one image visible in each of these comps, right? Follow. Okay. I want with this stack of images, I want to have one of these visible in each of these comps. Yes. Okay. So instead of going <coughs> comp one, I'm just going to delete everything but layer one. Comp two, then everything but layer two. Comp three, delete everything but layer three. I'm going to use an expression here in my opacity, and I'm going to say if my layer number matches the comp name, then I'm visible. So the name of this layer is, uh, sorry, the name of this comp is what? One. One. So my index is what? One. One. So if index one equals 
comp name one, then I'm going to be 100% opaque. Okay. So this guy here, <coughs> look at that. So the comp name is one. The index number is one. Right here. Two. Two. Two is not equal to one, so it gives me zero. Right. So After Effects, whenever I duplicate my comps, After Effects will name them sequentially with the next number. Right? Yes. So the next one is three, and if I open this, three is the name of the comp. Three is the layer that I want to reveal. And so it says, yes, I'm three, I match three, I'm 100%. Does that make more sense it now? It makes more sense now. Okay. Yeah. And then and I if just. You kept, if you kept duplicating up to number eight, then nothing. It won't work. Yeah, it won't show it won't anything. Visible, yeah. There's nothing visible because there's no index number eight. In terms of sizing, though, just because the, just because only one is opaque, you'll still resize all of them. Because they're all still there, right? Correct. But they, if they are all different sizes, and I do fit to comp uh, width, uh -huh. then they will all fit themselves to the comp width, right. and I won't have to go in and do the scaling. Okay. So now, I mean, I think. The end product of this would be to throw all those comps into another comp, right? Correct. I mean, or you could render a lot of separate or, clips and then arrange them in like a presentation somewhere. Yeah. And you could reorder them. Do the <coughs> That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Thanks. Yep. And then, uh, so I was going to talk about brainstorm. <clears throat> hey, when you have questions, I really want to help you understand. So don't let it don't let it slide. Just Let's make sure that you get it to the point where you can start working with it yourself. Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, so, creating presets. Um, let me think of, yeah, so you can actually, when you create your own presets, uh, we're going to folder those. Let's create another comp, call it text. Uh, so if you come up with a, a bunch of text stuff, text animations that you like, I for sure I had those in here. Um, text animating. So of course After Effects has a ton of stuff that you can do. Uh, I'm going to open up 2014 because I have some presets that I've already created. And if you, if you create something that you like that is, uh, exists on a single layer, you can create a preset for it. So if I have some text like uh, that, and I, how dramatic, very dramatic, look over here to this guy, <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I want to do, text random in through. So at some point I created a preset where the text um, has a text animation preset and no matter what I put in there <coughs> It does the animation like that, okay? Uh, so how do you do that? So 
<clears throat> we will build us a preset. <clears throat> I'm going to create promo text and I'll have the text start with a position and it's going to ramp up and it's going to be the line my offset is at negative 100 and sorry I need to set up a new per character 3d I'm gonna send it back here like that <clears throat> and I want it to um, move through this but I want, it, I want it to swoop in, but be continually moving toward the camera and then swoop past, okay? So I can, let's see, I can create a position movement here. Let's go like that. There, and we'll have it fade out when it gets to there. Alright, so let's go back to our text animation. And I've got my offset. I want to just come back to the original position at 100%. And I want it to ease in like that. I'm just going to go ahead and center up. Uh, it's not doing what I want. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to change my character a little bit. So I don't, I don't want to fiddle around with it so much that I can fix it. You'll get the gist, because we're almost done. So it does have that play in like that. And I can also add an opacity to it and set that to zero. And then I will I'm going to duplicate that animator. Just move my keyframes like that. And do a ramp down. So ramp up is bringing the text in, and ramp down is taking the text out. And that's where you find this right here ramp down. And my position, I'm going to bring it, let's say, minus 200. And the opacity goes back to zero. I think maybe my position keyframes are too much. So we'll just go here and do Z. I'll just do minus instead see what that looks like so we're in and we zoom in like that and just for fun we will do it similar to that first one and go with instead of lines we'll do characters and randomize. And for this one, we'll do characters as well, but we'll just let them be so they go out 
beginning to end like that. So there's the random. There's the out. Okay. So now I'm going to select all the things that I've changed. I'll come back here to the beginning. Select all the things that I've changed, including my position. Is it just keyframes? Can you just hit okay. you? Uh, yeah, I can hit you, but I, I want to make sure that, you know, I can say like this is going to be called promo text. So I can click source text here and it'll keep the source text. Mm -hmm. um, I can do uh, material options, whatever, but they don't have to have keyframes. If it's just the keyframes I want, maybe I can just roll down the keyframes. Right. But if you change the default value, then you need to select it. Right. Okay. And I can hit UU like that, and it'll show me all the default values I've changed. Okay. Right. But I know that I want to get that and that and that. And I'll go effect, um, save animation preset. I'll call this promo text. that and then it rebuilds this and I can look for promo text there it is right there and if I delete that I can double click and so it didn't save my my actual text it just gave me the Adobe After Effects thing but I can go promo like that Can you also save presets for effects and layers? You can, um, but it has to be the same layer. If you're going to do more than one layer, uh, things across layers, you have to learn how to do scripting. Okay. But you know, if we wanted to set this to be um, like uh, generate. I'll put a fill on there like that. And then we can make it alternate colors. That just like that. Actually it would do probably twirl down my effect like that. And yes, so then I have I used command select and I selected through there. And if I wanted to alternate colors, um, so there's a way to do that inside the text animator, but I would have to fuddle around with it a little bit in order to show you that. Um, let's say well, I, wanted, actually, I wanted to do a random generator. Yeah, yeah let's well, just let's well, just that say wasn't I wasn't actually what I was suggesting. I was just implying that that might be possible. Yes, it yeah. is possible. So I can even. With my effect, I can change the color. Like that. And then, so we're going to have to come in here, let's twirl that up, and get animator, animator, fill, and position. That. And if I wanted to make sure it said promo, I could come in here and do a thing like that and also copy that. Fill color just to make sure and position, animation save, animation preset. Write that one so it builds it again and delete that guy. Double click so you could have a preset where a laser effect moves across the screen from left to right. Mm -hmm. And can do all you have to do is build it, select the things that you have 
uh, change, select and, the things you want to save, and hit save preset. And you can save a, a specific motion for one specific layer that you created. Because mm -hmm. it's calculating keyframes as yeah. well. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's saving all keyframes. And if I hit U there, you can see that all the keyframes were saved along with. Has anyone ever <coughs> used like FF Toolbar or KBar? Mm -hmm. They're well, they're plugins that basically allow you to create buttons for presets. So like let's say you do like you know a, a certain glow or a, like a fade out or anything. But is it toolbar or toolbox? Yeah, toolbar or it could be toolbox. I don't know. No, no, no maybe toolbar. Not. They're all on, they're both on AE scripts. Um, man, is that what's called? Pretty sure that's what it's called because I looked it up on AE scripts. Um, toolbar. FT toolbar. FT. <clears throat> yeah, there's not an FF. FT. Yeah, so it's basically just a way you can kind of customize an interface just for, you know, you can use presets or it's just a, a multiple. It's kind of just like, if you're, I don't know if you ever use drag thing, it's a Mac thing, where basically you can just kind of create these custom macros. Where's the X console? Right there. Yeah, that one's huge. Okay. It's free. Yeah. It's basically. So, it's, I was going to show you a picture of FX console. FX, sorry, FX console, but. What's the image of picture on FX console? What does it do? It is a uh, heads up display effect launcher. So you hit a hotkey and then you can just type in like any effect. Um, I think or it's basically. I think maybe presets even that you have installed. Maybe. Uh, so instead of digging through. Yeah, and digging through the menu, you just hit a hotkey and then you start typing. And then you can also like start prioritizing. You know, no, I prefer the camera lens blur over like Gaussian blur. Oh, yeah. that's right. And so you can start kind of prioritizing. And yeah, so it's it's a big uh, efficiency. It's not like the tab in, the, uh, in Nuke. Where you could pull up anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I think there's like a C menu in in uh, Cinema Smart. 4D that right. you can pull up. Yeah. Shift C. So yeah, you're you're right. Here. That's uh, so as far as efficiencies go, that will maybe get you some things that you haven't seen before. Some get your wheels turning on some stuff um, going forward. Know that if you customize your After Effects, if you start relying on the FX toolbar or your own presets or your own render templates, things like that, you need to have a way to take that with you. So if you go, if you're freelance and you go to somebody's place and you're trying to be as efficient as possible, but you don't take any of your presets or your uh, render settings or your FX stuff with you that you can install. Maybe they won't let you install anything. Then you're you're gonna step back in your efficiency. So be careful how much you start relying on. <clears throat> know the interface. Know what you're looking for. How to find stuff. But um, but it seems like you could basically kind of create a template. Like you know I've got like you know. And your After Effects, uh, you know, scripts and your UI scripts mm -hmm. folder, you can almost kind of, I guess you could just like copy that to your laptop and copy it to your desktop. And in theory, they're both the same. That's so. correct. Yeah. That's correct. So yes, take it with you. So how do you bring a preset with you and upload it onto someone else's computer? In the Applications folder, you have Presets. And then this is the thing that I've been building over a while. Um, also, oh, these are what I was going to show you. Text presets. Um, so what you would do is just either zip it or copy it onto your thumb drive, take it to their computer, open up their presets folder, and drop it in. Okay. And when you open up After Effects, uh, if After Effects is already open, then you would need to go here and refresh, refresh list. 
in order to see your presets. Okay. Cool. cool. All right. Can I have one last well, question? One last question. So, like, uh, workspaces, you guys ever, like, import and export your workspaces? Is that possible to import them? I uh, believe you can save them. Or is it, like, them? do Creative yeah, you, Cloud? You can, you can yeah. definitely save them, but they're a little more varied, so you have to just do a web search. You can find out where okay. those files are kept. Yeah. They're kind of the mm -hmm. preferences. And, yeah. Uh, so there we go. Um, let's see. I'll go back to that. And I'm really glad that you guys were here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, if you were watching online, <laughs> then I would really appreciate it if you came to the meeting so you could participate. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next time. It's the fourth Thursday of every month. There will be information forthcoming about the March meeting on the website. So if you haven't uh, signed up with the group or asked to join the group at facebook.com slash group slash group slash Dallas A E U G, yeah. or as we like to call it, Dayug. Dayug. Um, Have you seen my new Dayug? <laughs> I did. He was very nice. Does your Dayug bite? <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.